And we're joined now by biophysicist and venture capitalist, Dr. Andrew Bogan. Dr. Bogan, um, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Where would you like to pick that up? What would you like to add to what's already been discussed? Well, I think you've captured very well the importance of doing prevalence testing on broad population samples and really understanding where we are with this disease, Steve. Um, I think that's not known. Uh, I think studies like ours, which can be replicated very quickly around the country and around the world, um, should be done and will help inform what the real numbers look like. So I just wanted to ask you to comment um, on the, this is a critical time, I think we all need to be clear about that. Decisions are being made about what comes after the April 30th national guidelines. People are, are, are wrestling with this question about how do we reopen our economies. I just would like your take, Dr. Bogan, on the, on, the, on the two plans. Let's just start with the Scott Gottlieb plan, um, which uh, it seems to me a lot of people are getting behind in uh, Washington and elsewhere, which is let's test everyone, uh, virus test everyone, and then we can isolate the people who have the virus and trace their contacts and so on and manage this um, going forward. Dr. Fauci seems to be very keen on that approach. What do you make of it? So testing is important, but we have to realize that there may be a lot of people who've already had this disease that you will not be able to test with a PCR test for active virus, the, the traditional testing that's been done. You'll only be able to detect that they already have this virus um, if you use a serologic test like the one we did or a laboratory version of it like the one being developed at Stanford now. Um, but I don't think it's going to be practical if the numbers of infections are as large as they might be, as you suggested earlier, um, to be doing contact tracing for every single infection on a global basis. Um, I just think that there's a very real chance here that this disease has progressed much further than we realize based on the undercounting biases of the way we've been doing testing so far. And if we were able to discover that that were the case, I am very hesitant to say that um, it would be feasible uh, to contact trace every single infection's contacts. That's an incredibly important point. You made it really clearly. Uh, we have to underline that because this seems to be the direction our policymakers are going in. The other one, uh, David, let me bring you in on this, is this idea of antibody immunity certificates that say, well, if you've had it, you can go back to work. But if the other person in your household hasn't had the virus, they just still have to stay in the shutdown. <laughs> what do you make of that, David? Well, I, you know, I, I, like, like you mentioned, you, should, you couldn't have said it better, um, you know, Steve, when, when you, in your opening monologue. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> You can't, you can't let people go back to work if they don't have it because it creates this perverse incentive that you're going to go out and try and get sick, especially if you know you're not going to get that sick. But it, it could create a, a much bigger crisis. I mean, just to, just to add you know, uh, something that Andrew just said you know, about, about, about the mass testing, you know, if 50% of the people who had it, who had it didn't even know they had it, and if 85% of the people had a mild case of it and never got tested, how can you trace 50% of the people who, who had it and didn't even know they had it? That's, that's just, a, that's crazy. I mean, you can see why these numbers that are coming out of, there's a, there's a, tech, uh, a study out of Denmark that shows uh, up to 30 to 80 times as many people that were tested have had, had the antibodies. There's a test out of, uh, there's a, a study out of Germany that says 15% of this town, you know, already has it, which is something that's like a hundred times what the, the German test rate is today. So, you know, it's, you know, like Andrew said, this has probably gone way beyond that, and we should really focus our efforts now on identifying who's really at risk and taking care of those people. That's what, what we should really be doing. That's right. That's what we're going to focus on. We've, we're going to keep talking about that. David and Andrew are going to stay with us. Dr. Bhattacharya is going to join us again straight after the break. Don't go away. We hear that a lot. It sounds like the science is now coming in behind that intuitive impulse that a lot of people have. Uh, had at the beginning. Is that how you see it? I think the science is headed in that direction now, but I, I think it also needs to be said that we should be respectful of the difficult decision that policymakers were faced with in the absence of data, because the science hadn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. And the importance of making the best decision you can make with the data, and the importance of having the best science drive new, better decisions now that we have more information coming out. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I th that's right. That's why I think all these questions you get all over the place about, well, why didn't they do that in February and so on? Just seem to be, you know, of course, there are some aspects of this we need to look into, but um, uh, it's not particularly helpful. We need to get this country reopened safely, but soon, as I said at the top. Andrew, one more thought from you on these other plans for reopening. It seems to me that there's a, one of the things that they have in common 
is just a lot of micromanagement and bureaucracy um, and being incredibly precise about who can go out and who has to stay home and all that kind of stuff. Are you confident that the, our kind of current systems are able to do that effectively? I think complicated bureaucracies and, and systems that are really detailed like that are always just very difficult in practice to implement and implement well. Uh, this is a serious disease. We need to take it seriously. We need to make sure we protect people that are most at risk from it. We need to make sure that we conquer this pandemic. But um, bureaucracy is rel relatively rarely a great solution for much. <laughs> I echo that and with full heart uh, from based on my experience working inside government. Um, David, you, we, and in our conversations, one of the points you've made um, often uh, is the tragic situation in our nursing homes um, and how that was made worse by some of the guidance and advice we saw right at the beginning. Just talk to that a little bit, if you would. Well, there was, a, there was a, an article that came out yesterday in the, in the New York Times. It was just amazing. It, just, it was heartbreaking, really. Um, you know, there was a, a paragraph that I have here that says, in New York, nursing homes administrators said they had been overwhelmed by the outbreak. They quickly, quickly spun out of control. They were unable to, they said, to have residents tested, to isolate the virus, or to get protective, and this is the key, to get protective equipment to keep the workers from getting sick or transmitting the virus to, to residents. So, I mean, no healthcare worker in any of those nursing homes went, went to work sick. They, they didn't go to work sick. I mean, they were obviously asymptomatic. They were, you know, uh, had the disease somehow. They transmitted it because they were told to wash their hands and keep a distance. They weren't, you know, they didn't have the same procedures that they had at a hospital, you know, where they both had masks on, where they kept their distance, where they made sure that those aerial droplets didn't, didn't make it, uh, you know, in, into those patients. So, you know, if I was the governor of a state now, watching what's happening in New York, knowing that 25% of all the people that died in New York were in nursing homes, the first thing I'd be doing is going to all the nursing homes and I'm providing them equipment and saying, don't let this happen in our state. If you want to flatten the curve, you get, you got 25% of the curve, you know, you could have flattened just by taking care of the nursing homes. And then, you know, there's, then there's obviously a lot of things that you can, you can do from there by, you know, um, identifying the people that have the same kind of health conditions of those people that were in the nursing homes and then making a huge effort to identify and isolate those people and, and teach them not, not, hey, just, you know, stay home with your grandkids, but no, you need to stay isolated. You need to talk about aerial droplets. You need to talk about how the disease is spread. And I am absolutely confident, you know, the economy is shut down today because we haven't figured out who the people are dying and, and, and you know, who they are exactly and how we can protect them. And I think we can do that if we really put our effort to it. And, and so we can, we can actually flatten the curve, keep it flat. And, and save more lives than we have now, and then we can save the economy as well. I mean, that's that's a secondary thing, but you know, I think we can do both if we do it right. Great. Well, David, thank you. That's a, that's a great way to wrap up the discussion. Um, and I think it should make it clear to everyone that this plan we're talking about tonight is not about just opening everything up and letting things rip. Uh, because we're not taking the disease seriously. It's exactly the opposite. It's precisely because we now know how contagious it is that we have this plan in mind. I really appreciate all the work that's gone into it. I know there's going to be lots of work ahead. And to your colleagues who couldn't be with us tonight, thank you very much.